The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. These webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website. Now, before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Kelly Barnhill is the director of the Nutrition Clinic at the Johnson Center for Child Health and Development. She is a certified clinical nutritionist with nearly two decades of experience working with nutrition in individuals with autism. In addition to her clinical practice, Kelly also serves as the Johnson Center's clinical care director overseeing management and implementation of multi multidisciplinary care across the practices within the organization. Kelly is also a member of ARI's Board of Directors and Scientific Advisory Panel. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, last year when Denise and I talked about uh, this topic, um, I told her I would love to speak to the ongoing need for use of a gluten and casein-free approach um, in serving children with ASD um, because I feel like it's something that uh, we've known about for a great time now and um, we are in a place where there are so many diets available and diets are recommended um, more and more frequently um, and knowledge is more widespread so really when we talk about the first approach to looking at dietary change and intervention in autism, is it still relevant today? It's kind of the question that I want to leave with um, as we begin this talk. So. Except now I have a frozen, oh, there we go. Um, my goals and objectives for this talk really are, um, I want to give you a brief history of how we've gotten to the place of talking about eliminating gluten and casein for autism. There are many other lectures that do that in great detail that you can find on the ARI website at autism.org. Um, but I, I want to go through just a history of the science at a very high level to give you perspective on how we got to this place. Then I want to talk a little bit about what we know about medical knowledge about gluten and casein-free interventions in general. Again, what, what have we learned over the past 25 or 30 years? What do we know? What's, what don't we know still? Uh, I want to take some time and look at the practicalities of dietary implementation if you do think about a gluten and casein-free diet, and then speak to um, your specific questions in, a, in discussion for a period of maybe 15 minutes at the end of this talk. So when we started looking at gluten and casein-free uh, diets, we did not have the knowledge that we do now of the impact of the gastrointestinal health and uh, the interaction really with neurological health. There are now hundreds of studies that have come out in the past decade pointing to very specific strains of bacteria that are implicated in specific neurological diagnoses and behaviors. 25 or 30 years ago, when researchers were just beginning to explore this hypothesis that specific foods such as gluten-containing and casein-protein-containing foods could actually impact the behavior of those with autism, we didn't have this knowledge. We didn't know what was driving it. Um, and now we know substantially more about this gut-brain axis and interconnection and we still have a lot more to learn, too. So just from a research perspective, um, gluten really, if you look at the research literature, there is pub a publication as early as the 1950s um, entitled Bread and Tears, Naughtiness, Depression, and Fits Due to Wheat Sensitivity which is this beautiful case study that outlines changes in a child's behavior um, with gluten-filled, wheat-filled food consumption and what happens when that child, um, when those are removed from the child's diet. Uh, now we know that that was actually probably a presentation of celiac disease with some ongoing neurological concerns, but really for me, this is one of the first 
gluten specific pieces of research literature that kind of leads us and points us to how we get to looking at gluten in removal and treating those with ASD today. For the next few decades, there are bits and pieces of work out there that look at uh, gluten in other neurological and psychiatric diagnoses with positive results. There are multiple case reports. There are also a few very small studies available looking at the elimination of gluten. Um, <clears throat> so we started early on looking at specific protein elimination in neurological concerns. Uh, in the 1980s, <clears throat> there was some early peptide work research that was beginning to look at gluten and casein components um, and the effect in autism. In 1991, um, Dr. Reichelt published some work looking at urinary peptides um, from casein and gluten proteins being elevated in kids with autism. Uh, that was expanded on by Dr. Paul Shattuck, looking at this buildup of opioid, opioid excess um, and this theory that perhaps what's happening is <clears throat> these um, casomorphin and gladiomorphins are suspects that um, are processed and um, present in the body uh, in a chemical similarity next to opiates. So there were several paper, papers published from the period of late 1980s to late 1990s, specifically looking at this avenue. And then uh, it was important from a clinical perspective, really, because families began to read about this, hear this, and try it. But it was really important from a clinical perspective because in the late 1990s, two mothers of children with autism wrote books um, that had a great impact, I feel, on clinical application of dietary intervention in autism. Both books um, were born of their own experience. One um, series, the Special Diets for Special Kids, one and two books, uh, provided a roadmap for families 20 years ago to really understand how we, how, how do we prepare foods that would completely eliminate these proteins and um, made it accessible to families who wanted to think about dietary change. Uh, Karen Sarusi's book, Autism and PDD, provided a lot of the rationale in addition to and other information on um, intervention, but she speaks greatly to the importance of dietary change and how it affected her child. And from a clinical perspective, this information out there for the layman really made the possibility of changing a diet more realistic. Now, we have things at our fingertips that can guide us, uh, but we didn't have that then. Um, and if you're interested in the specifics of starting it now, there are multiple webinars at that link noted here uh, available on the website that can teach specifics of dietary implementation with resources and recipes and meal planning and rationale. Uh, but I didn't want to take time today to go through that. I just want to say that there are many other opportunities to learn specifically about how to do this at this link. So where are we now? Uh, in 2015, um, a review was published of all of the paperwork um, in the research literature looking at GFCF diets for the treatment of autism from 2005 to 2015. Uh, as you might expect, it was a mixed bag. And the most positive remark that was made is that we need to be looking at subtyping, so deciding which children may or may not respond to the diet and making recommendations accordingly, and that really should be driving the research. And from a clinical perspective, that's something that knowledgeable clinicians who've been doing this for a while continue to do. If, if you work with a professional who has trialed intervention, there are multiple screening tools that many can use now to decide if it's an appropriate fit for a specific individual or not. But this paper, and you can link to the entire paper here, um, speaks to the lack of validity for a GFCF intervention. There's really no evidence in any of the literature that they explored in that window of time 
that says, yes, it's something that people should do. Um, but for me, the hopeful piece that, that takes away is it does speak to the idea that there's a belief that certain children and individuals can benefit from removal of these proteins, and we need to be better at identifying, speaking to from a research perspective, and identifying those kids in clinical practice um, as potential um, kids who can benefit from this intervention. So since that time, a few other studies have been published. Uh, Susan Hyman's group published uh, a double-blind uh, trial in kids with autism four years ago, and um, another researcher in Spain um, published a similar approach. They're both double-blind controlled with various um, setups. Uh, and organizations, but the outcome for both was the same. There, the results were mixed and both concluded that there is not enough evidence to recommend a gluten and casein-free approach for kids with autism at this time. In 2017 and 2018, two more review papers came out. These were both systematic reviews, meaning they went through and reanalyzed the data and looked at um, those results both, again, came to the conclusion that there is no direct evidence that a gluten and casein-free dietary approach can be beneficial for kids with autism, but that more research will be needed, again, into that subtyping issue that uh, I mentioned. And I really want to speak to um, the review paper perspective specifically just for a moment, and that is I value the contributions of all of the research, the body of literature that's out there on this area. It's not easy to do a dietary intervention study. Um, it is difficult to line up funding for something like that because there really is no product that benefits in a sale or um, there's no potential profit motive really at the end um, of that study. And therefore, funds are limited and uh, we still, now don't see and acknowledge the impact that diet and food and what we're putting into our mouths each day can have on all of these body systems that we're talking about. Um, so it's very hard to get funding. It's very hard to design an appropriate study these days. Um, and many of the reviews that are uh, published include studies that have designs that in retrospect, may or may not have been the most appropriate data gathering mechanism. For example, diets, GFCF diets that are um, maintained for a very short period of time and then reversed. So a child is placed in a control group for three weeks where they're getting um, foods containing gluten and casein, then placed in um, a case group where they go on a gluten and casein free diet for a period of three weeks, and they may or may not switch back, and families are blinded to all of that. Well, the problem there for me is that if you look at the bulk of the science literature, we know that it takes a lot longer than three weeks for a child who has an immunological response to gluten for that antibody response to normalize. So in my mind and in um, in, in reviewing the ideas of study um, design, I feel strongly that there are things that we need to address and speak to in some of those studies that have had negative outcomes solely because they didn't include perspective on all of the ways that gluten and casein proteins could be impacting um, biolog the body. Um, another study I wanted to point out was a study that was published uh, just a few years ago, that's actually very positive. It noted a positive response with the ATAC and CARS reports for ketogenic and gluten and casein-free diets, though ketogenic provided a greater response. And I think this result um, was not a very large study. Um, it's, not, um, it's not been replicated, um, but it's important one, because there was data, behavioral data collected that showed change, 
And two, it points us in the direction that clinically what we know now to be true and what research seems to, to, to be true, and that is it's, it's bigger than, and what we're thinking about in terms of dietary change is bigger than just eliminating two problem foods. It is bigger than looking at two culprits, gluten and casein, and saying that's all we have to do. Um, because we know uh, now through our work over the past several decades that dietary manipulation and is as much as it is about eliminating exposure to certain things. It's also about including nutrient-dense, nourishing foods, if not more so. And I wanted to uh, toss this one in briefly. This is a paper that was just published this week looking at solely a gluten-free diet in kids with autism. Very small, I think 66 total subjects enrolled, but again, they found no difference in gluten-filled versus gluten-free diets in terms of behaviors for the kids that they studied. I haven't seen the full study. I've just read the abstract, but we're still thinking about it. All over the world, um, people are publishing on this, um, and it's a question, I think, that remains in the minds of those who work with kids with autism, who work with them clinically, and also think about this from a research perspective. It's unanswered in my mind. Um, and I say that as we go back to, one, the uh, lack of multi-subject case-controlled, well-designed studies to tell us um, which subtypes might respond well. And two, from a clinical perspective, it's very hard to marry the idea that we shouldn't bother with this with the experience that as a treating clinician you see uh, when you recommend a dietary change or intervention for a child. So right now, I ran through that um, as quickly as I could. I wanted to kind of give you a big picture overview of what the literature tells us now. Uh, now I want to kind of take a deep breath and talk a little bit about what we should do with all of that. So again, we're speaking to, um, and the research now has really shifted and looks more at this gut-brain connection, gut-brain access, and what's going on in there, and how we alter, manipulate, and change that living, breathing microbiota, um, and uh, how that affects what we're doing in terms of dietary recommendations and dietary change. So hundreds of papers out there now looking at the impact of um, GI microbiome on neurological disease, on inflammation, on behaviors. Um, from a clinical perspective, there are many, many products now that are being marketed to professionals and also direct to consumer that focus on altering the microbiome and improving your health. So there are multiple, both professional and over-the-counter products now that contain um, probiotics, strains that are supposedly researched to um, impact mood and improve, improve mood. Um, some of those are really solid, healthy, good products, and some of them are capitalizing on this new interest at, um, of treating the microbiome. So it's very hard to distinguish without some background knowledge of where and what and how to go about intervening um, and working on diligently on building a healthy microbiome and, and utilizing data and resources to um, answer the bigger picture of how do we uh, how do we heal how do we build health in the gut uh, and gluten and casein uh, removal may be a piece of that picture it may not be for some children but it is I believe still absolutely vital that we that we consider the response to proteins like gluten, casein, and soy when we talk about building a dietary intervention for an individual with autism who um, may or may not have GI, overt GI symptoms and may or may not have overt behaviors that can be associated with GI symptoms. So I wanna shift a little bit now and talk about the stuff going in. I want to talk about food and I want to talk about diet and a little tiny bit about what we've learned in the past 20 or 25 years in terms of 
is it just about taking gluten and casein out? And the answer is no, it's not. It's more complicated than that. Um, I think that that's a piece of the puzzle for many kids. I think that we still don't know why, and the research literature cannot tell us why many kids um, respond to elimination of gluten and casein. We just don't have the absolute on that, and I don't know if we will or not, but what we do know clinically is that there are children whose GI symptoms improve and whose neurological symptoms improve and behaviors improve when one or both of those proteins and others are eliminated from their intake. The other piece of this, for example, and when I say it's more than just we're, what we're taking out, but also really what we're building and putting in, uh, I, I mean that we need to be thinking about a diet that is perhaps gluten and casein free, but it is not a diet that's filled with gluten and casein free packaged foods. Because one of the bigger issues that we have, I think, is that if you look at the way, this is still true, this distribution of um, typical American diets, typical westernized diets of how our macronutrients are distributed, that huge chunk that's red of carbohydrates is largely processed carbohydrates from packaged foods. It's breads, it's cereals, it's other grains that are not necessarily complex and whole. It is lots of the packaged stuff that we tend to consume on a, an easy basis. So the fast food stops, the, um, the center aisles of the grocery store, those ingredients in our diets contain lots and lots of these carbs that then feed that bacteria that we're desperately trying to address and improve. So <clears throat> I think it's a twofold issue from uh, looking at a gluten and casein-free diet. I think that elimination of protein such as gluten is, a, it is recommended for some kids and can be uh, problematic if we simply sub out all of that gluten food with gluten-free similarly processed products. What we want to do more is shift some of that, some of the ratios that you see here so you're getting higher fats and higher protein intake and fewer carbs. And that tends to be the direction that some of our work and some of our clinical, some of our clinical work and some of our research is going these days. So we're looking at interventions and recommending interventions that may exclude, may and likely exclude gluten and casein, but also include this rich diversity of other foods that help build um, health. So just to summarize that, I, I, I want to pause and say that in rethinking about this issue clinically, um, I always pause with families when we're talking in consultation because this is as much about inclusion as elimination, and there are lots of barriers to including new things, and I understand that completely. It is less of a barrier in terms of acceptance from the generalized medical population than it once was. So. 20 years ago, pediatricians didn't know about this diet, didn't want kids on this diet, and they're more, a little bit more accepting of it now, even though it doesn't bear out in the research literature to date necessarily. But as a realist and someone who's very practical, I think about this in terms of there are populations around the world that avoid casein protein completely in their diets without negative health effects. So it can be done. We are not imposing a negative in a population that um, will have detrimental effects long term. Um, so vegetarians may or may not consume any of these things. Vegans, those with IgE allergies, those who have identified IgG responses, and there have been many IgG responses documented now from an allergy HP perspective. So um, from an immunological impact standpoint, many people avoid milk completely for a variety of reasons, and as long as their nutritional needs are met, they are okay. Similarly, many populations in the world avoid gluten completely without any negative effects. Several cultures just don't contain a lot of gluten filled, don't, diets don't contain a lot of gluten filled foods to begin with, but those with medical diagnoses such as celiac disease, 
um, Crohn's disease treatment, uh, ulcerative colitis, the, the, the specific carbohydrate diet has been used for years in those with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so I think that we have more knowledge of uh, gluten's impact on overall health. We do know that there are multiple populations that have reported improvement once it's eliminated from the diet. And we know that as long as, again, nutritional needs are met when you remove it, um, there's very little risk when evaluating pros, cons here. So why would you make a dietary change? And why would a clinician recommend a dietary change for their family? Well, the big reasons are improving gastrointestinal status. So many families come in with kids who continue to have ongoing, what sometimes we call toddler diarrhea when they're much older, kids who are severely constipated, kids who have belly distension, kids who have um, trouble with reflux, trouble with many other things. So changing and altering diet, whether it's gluten and dairy or 10 other shifts in addition to that, has the potential to impact gastrointestinal status for the kids we serve. It also has the ability to lower and stabilize blood sugar, which I think is key, and that speaks back to that whole carbohydrate component here. Um, Gluten and casein have not been directly linked in the literature um, in this population yet to manage blood sugar levels um, and stabilizing blood sugar levels, but we sure know that processed carbs, carbs can and do affect blood sugar, and that can be problematic. Um, there is uh, an impact on inflammation. There's improvement or can be improvement in cognitive function. Again, you will see that in that last research study I mentioned looking at keto, gluten-free, casein-free, and no dietary change, noting ATEX and CARS improvement for both the keto and GFCF groups. Um, there's improvement in behavior. Many families report kids sleep through the night for the first time, or they don't have middle of the night waking. So the potential for growth here and the potential for positive change um, is pretty significant. And the resources we have available now to assist with and speak to dietary change are significant. So how do you make a dietary change? Um, the most effective way to do this is to get professional support from someone who knows it well and has done it so they can help you evaluate, is it casein, is it gluten, is it both proteins, is it just one? And what other things do we need to be adding in and taking out and building from to begin here? Uh, I understand there is a hesitancy there, but know that many dietitian and nutritionist appointments are covered by insurance. So don't assume that that's an out of pocket expense for those with limited resources. Um, many nutritionists and dietitians also re um, consult remotely, so you can access their help online, and that is. Um, yeah, a benefit if there's no one in your local area. Uh, when you begin a change, you need to gather that information and hopefully work in tandem with a professional, proceed cautiously and collect lots of data, and then monitor that data for the impact and adjust accordingly. And you need a fairly objective resource, that professional, who can help you decide if what you're doing is truly making a difference for your child. Um, and you can have the data and documentation to support that for other purposes too. So when you're in the community, when you're in schools, when you're in other educational settings, um, the data is highly useful in helping um, other professionals make decisions and decide what's best for your child and for you, frankly, to be able to express and support the need for lack of gluten-containing foods as a reinforcer in an ABA program, for example. So why would you not make dietary change? So from a professional perspective, I would say if you have a medically complex child and a lack of professional support, those are two kind of caution flags for me. 
uh, I would say put those things in place, particularly if you have a child who has a seizure disorder, who has an underlying metabolic condition that's overt and has been diagnosed. Um, if your child has severely restricted eating habits, and by severely restricted, I mean your child eats six foods or less um, and goes on food jags and will only eat the same food for a period of time or something severe like that. Um, I don't mean a picky eater because often when we explore what a picky eater looks like, we have kids who have preferences for foods, but their nutritional needs are close to or almost being met, and they just have very strong preferences for foods, and they consume 10 to 25 foods. And while we would like to expand that diet, that is not a reason for us to say, let's not intervene here. Um, I would also include here, there's lack of formal research to support it, because I hope in that very brief overview earlier, I uh, offered you links that you can go back and look at the data for yourself if you like, but also just to say that our research isn't conclusive because we haven't been able to effectively evaluate this in the proper subgroups of kids. So we know clinically that some kids respond, but it is not at a level that has been documented to be significant from a research perspective in any organized, blinded, controlled study yet. Other things to consider and that families hesitate on are concerns with a child's ability to comply with getting uh, blood work, stool, and urine testing done, um, and the idea that testing can be cost prohibitive. And I would say that working with your practitioner, you can choose and make informed decisions about which tests are appropriate and necessary and which will not define um, whether or not you pursue a diet. So ideally, yes, you can start with a full gamut of baseline data that includes looking at any potential autoimmune response, looking at any um, allergy response, but if you, uh, that should not be a barrier to being able to make a dietary change for your child. Um, there's a belief in the community that clean food so a diet that's clean and free of gluten and casein costs more, but does it really? If you look at um, what a very healthy, simple gluten and casein free diet looks like, you'll recognize that um, it actually doesn't have to. We are talking fresh uh, fruits and vegetables, minimal processed foods, um, healthy fats and healthy proteins, and all of those, um, are <clears throat> things that um, can be secured in a cost-effective way. Um, and there are a few resources both on the autism.org website and the Johnson Center website for building a cost-effective dietary intervention, so tips and tricks for doing that. Um, there's the idea that there are um, social or cultural or familial barriers, so um, you have family, you, you lack family support for an intervention like this. It's, it seems foreign and unfamiliar and therefore people are opposed to it. Um, there's the impact of birthday parties and other celebrations that families worry about. And uh, I promise you, as we talk through this and um, work through it with families in consultation, uh, these are also things that can be worked through successfully if you're committed to thinking about changing dietary uh, intake for your child. And I guess finally, the last thing that families express concern over is this lack of environmental control. So you can't really, you can't really control what grandma is going to give your son. You can't really control whether your child will be given birthday cake uh, at an after-school party or not. You don't have the, the ability to manage that in all environments, but actually you do if you build buy-in from those community members. Uh, and you can do that with data and information. You can do that with very specific information on what they can and cannot have. Um, and so I think all of those things in terms of cons and reasons why it may not work for some people can be overcome for a family who's committed to doing. 
the last thing I really want to do is kind of walk through the, the specific nutritional concerns with eliminating gluten and casein from a diet because that's often what professionals will say your child is not getting enough of this or your child may get too much of that or um, and, and I want to speak to and give you clear facts and data on what to do about that if it's something that you um, and also perspective really on how we think about this from a, a professional perspective from a clinical perspective so if you're talking about eliminating gluten so you a child or an adult who's just diagnosed with celiac disease will get a lot of literature these days on what that means and what to eliminate. But from a nutritional perspective, the macronutrient that's most important when you eliminate anything containing gluten is fiber. So because our diets are heavy on processed carbs, heavy on these complex carbs, that's where some of our fiber comes from. Um, and a large part of our fiber comes in the form of the oatmeal or the Cheerios or other cereals that we have in the morning and the grain that's in the pizza crust. Um, and so that fiber is lost. If you approach a gluten-free diet from a, a healthy perspective where you're thinking about what you're putting in as well as what you're eliminating, you're not necessarily subbing apples to apples or gluten-filled pizza crust for gluten-free pizza crust on most days. What you're doing is thinking through where do I get that fiber um, and how do I make sure that that need is now met because that is typically a loss. Similarly, when we lose those grains, we also lose the vitamin and minerals that are now fortified in our grain supply um, in large part with um, a number of B vitamins that uh, we know we are typically deficient in, and so we add them back in to these processed carbohydrates. And in doing so, we, we encourage and we uh, largely meet RDA requirements. Um, but if we take that away, many gluten-free similar products are not fortified, and we need to address that loss as well. So from a fiber perspective, I've said this a few times now, but you just want to think about adding fresh fruit and vegetables in. That's where fiber comes from. The other component here is managing water intake because you want to increase that water intake to avoid any constipation that's associated with a lower fiber diet. And then consider a fiber supplement if you need to. There are a number of gluten-free fiber supplements out there that if this approach is something that you're already on and you're experiencing some concerns or you don't have enough fiber in the diet, there are things that you can do. Aloe vera is a good one. Inulin can be used, but I caution the use of that as a prebiotic because it can also feed bad bacteria. Um, there are other fibers like Heather's tummy fiber that can be used just to keep um, fiber and bulk um, in the diet at this time. The other thing you want to think about is uh, replacing those minerals and vitamins that are lost through the loss of fortified foods. And uh, that really is just um, looking at a high quality multivitamin and multimineral product. And in doing that, um, I would say you want to be careful with what you choose. You want to make sure you're choosing a high quality vitamin. This is an industry that is largely unregulated, though there are many manufacturers who regulate themselves. They voluntarily um, comply with multiple regulations and inspections so that they can speak to the ingredients, what is in their um, supplement and what isn't in their supplement. And many, many cannot. So I encourage you to look for high quality um, products because one fish oil is not another fish oil. One multivitamin is definitely not another multivitamin. And, we need to know that we're using the most effective and available form both for absorption but also the the reason that we would be using that vitamin um, and there are several manufacturers out there who make very high quality therapeutic multivitamins that look at and speak to um, vitamin and mineral losses, nutrient deficiencies for kids um, that, and offer uh, therapeutic level of those uh, vitamins and minerals that are known to be needed and um, affect behavior uh, in children with ASD. 
So what are the biggest nutrition concerns with eliminating all milk products? Well, there, this is a little bit more complex only because often we have kids who are under two now and we need to make sure they're getting enough fat because they're building their brains, 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 brains. Um, and that's the main component. We need to be getting lots of healthy fat in there. And that's why we say whole milk for those kids and protein, uh, calcium and vitamin D. So from a macronutrient perspective, we need to be looking at changing where fat comes from. Protein perspective, we need to be making sure they're meeting protein requirements and also um, vitamin D and calcium needs. In terms of healthy fats, the most beneficial thing I think we can do is simply add an omega-3 fatty acid support product that's high quality to the diet because all of us are low in the in, intake of omega-3 fatty acids and we can all benefit from additional high quality oils there. Uh, you can use omega-3, um, omega-9 plant-based fats for added healthy support in the diet. So you can use um, lots of good uh, nut oils or avocado oil or coconut oil to prepare foods um, and minimize processed omega-6 oil support. So a lot of us consume a good deal of omega-6 oil because it's a processed oil in our diets and we just need to be mindful also of the healthy fats from animal protein sources in our current diets because that's another great resource for things like um, lard and um, tallow that we consume through the protein that we're eating that um, as long as that contribute to our overall fat intake as well. In terms of protein intake, just know that most Western diets contain far more protein than our DNA and DRI values. Um, reasonable animal and plant-based protein intake likely meets daily intake for all. There are very few circumstances unless we have a, uh, an individual who's highly, highly selective that protein intake needs are not being met. Um, and I would just say focus on sources, uh, so high quality sources, know where it's coming from and the quantity to meet needs. Uh, but don't feel like um, by removing milk protein from the diet, you are you might be decreasing their total protein intake, but you will not be putting them at risk or probably likely even close to at risk of not meeting the daily requirements. In terms of calcium, we know calcium is vitally important for building bones and teeth. Um, it also plays a role in muscular and nerve function. And I suggest choosing a high quality practitioner recommended supplement only because those typically tend to be more bioavailable forms of calcium than an over-the-counter version that's readily available, which means that your body can actually use the nutrition from that calcium rather than um, uh, not have access to it. And uh, I, I, there are a number of options out there. I would say the one that I most often say families should minimize in their supplement is calcium carbonate because that seems to be a form that's very poorly absorbed. In terms of vitamin D, it's a cofactor and plays a role in bone and phosphorus absorption. Um, a deficiency in vitamin D leads to rickets, which is a bone disease. Um, and it also plays a role and it's particularly valuable in the population of kids that we serve, I think, in supporting an uh, an appropriate immune response. So a deficiency in vitamin D can lead to increased illness, it can lead to increased autoimmunity, it's associated with allergies, it's associated with asthma. So we want good levels of vitamin D um, in the body and uh, you of course want, ideally you get uh, baseline data and for uh, some time pediatricians were screening vitamin D levels for kids. I don't know that they're doing that as regularly as the AAP recommended. Um, but I feel like getting that number, uh, if you have other blood work scheduled is important because then that will allow you and your practitioner to know how much your child needs and whether he actually needs more than uh, is recommended for daily intake. Again, I would say choose the product you use wisely. D3 tends to be the version that we use. Um, because it, again, is an absorption issue. And I just want to close really by saying that um, 
there are still there are still more questions than answers in terms of whether gluten and casein um, and gluten and casein free diets are implicated and necessary in um, serving those with autism. And I think that we still don't know ultimately, but I do believe that it can have profound impact for some children. And for that reason, we still need to keep looking and understand the mechanism of action and specifically what's working and why in those kids. So thank you so very much for your time and attention. I, I think I have about 15 minutes for questions and I'm happy to take them now. Great, thank you, Kelly. Thanks for all of that information in the presentation. We do have a lot of questions, so I'll dive right in. Uh, the first question is about IgG and IgE testing. So I'm sure you are asked this a lot. The traditional allergy tests um, sometimes don't turn up with allergies to gluten and casein. I know you talked on this a bit. So if you're talking to a pediatrician or your mother-in-law or somebody about you know, the fact that the tests don't actually navigate directly to this, what are some, do you have any tips about how to talk about that in a way that makes sense? Like your elevator speech about that? <laughs> uh, I can try. I, um, I, I think that there are multiple levels that um, gluten and casein could be affecting each individual. So there might be a positive autoimmune response. So a celiac panel might turn up something positive that a traditional IgE test to wheat and gluten won't. Um, it could be that a child has a true IgE allergy to either casein or gluten or both, though that is rarer than not. And when we RAS test, so when we do blood level testing on those, some allergists and specialists will accept that as a true allergy and some will say, um, okay, now we need to do skin prick testing to confirm these results. And I think what that speaks to, and, and then there's the issue of IgG, delayed allergy response or intolerance response or however we wanna speak to it. And I think that that just tells us we don't know what we don't know. Um, I point to, when I talk to families about this, the idea that there's an ample body of research out there now looking at IgG testing. Um, for casein in a number of other disease processes. So a number of autoimmune issues, diabetes, uh, and that to me says we are on to something here and thinking about it from an immunological perspective. We just haven't touched on it yet. And when we talk with families, I guess the other thing I would say is we will recommend this for you if you are all in and want to try it in a way that is healthy and safe. And we know that the data from the labs can be accurate or not. And so we have many kids who show positive responses to dietary intervention who have normal results on those test panels. And we have many kids who show no response to dietary intervention who actually have positive allergy responses. So our bodies are so complex and I think we have to be mindful of understanding that we're in the early stages of piecing through this for a true response. But that I, I think families absolutely should try it if they want to, whether the data is there or not to support it. I'm gonna try to tie together several questions here because they all have sort of a common theme. This is about the differences in gluten between different grains. And I had several questions about, you know, are oats good, gluten-free oats? Do steel-cut oats have good fiber? And another person who's a clinician wrote in and said, what's up with oats? They're turning up in all of my, my food sensitivity tests now. So maybe we can tackle oats and maybe talk just a little bit about gluten as it occurs in different grains. Okay. So my thought would be, in, in speaking to oats specifically, we now have a population of a, a good quality oat that's certified gluten-free and tested here. Um, gluten uh, is not 
found in oats per se, but they are a compromised product. They are a compromised crop due to processing in the same places that other gluten-containing grains are. And so there are some that are now grown and processed in facilities that are dedicated gluten-free facilities, making them completely gluten-free. Many kids, many individuals who are gluten-free can tolerate um, gluten-free oats. Okay, the next thing that's emerging though, I think as we do this, is that there's a body of literature out there, it's quite small, but it looks at oats actually triggering a similar response in celiac disease that gluten does, and there, we don't know why. Um, so there is this notion that oats in themselves can also contribute to an inflammatory and autoimmune process that we don't know enough about. So this is very early stuff and we don't know enough about it to speak to it, um, I think, from an expert perspective or even experience. And I would say that um, oats are something that we recommend with caution in certain sub populations. And I think it has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. In terms of other grains and their gluten um, content, um, you want to avoid all wheat. I know that there is some discussion online, there is some discussion in the literature, and also clinically that certain ancient grains and other forms of wheats may or may not be okay, but when you're following a strict gluten and casein-free diet, we strongly recommend adhering to the letter um, for a, a lengthy period of time until you get accurate data and then you know and can test things like, is this a grain that can be tolerated or not? Um, and of course, in that time frame, you also avoid all other gluten contaminated or containing things like barley and rice. All right, the next question is about omegas. So you talked a little bit about the omegas that are out there. This is a good question. They're asking, where does omega-6 hide? I'm sorry, where does omega-6 hide? Like, where does it turn up? So if I you're see. trying to make so sure you're using the right omega. Using yeah. the right oils and including fats. Omega-6 oils that you want to avoid are those that are commonly seen on our grocery shelves. So canola oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, um, those contain processed versions. Um, there are some unrefined um, oils that are omega-6s that are okay, but largely what you want to think about when you choose fats and oils from that section of the grocery store is thinking about a plant-derived oil that um, may come from a nut. So there are lots of um, shelf-stable oils that you can use red palm oil can also be really good. I think I didn't mention that one earlier. Um, but in general, what you want to think about are those oils that we knew to be hydrogenated oils 15 years ago before we decided that we shouldn't be hydrogenating oils to make them stable. Um, so anything that we use to fry in typically, those are the things that we want to be careful of. Olive oil can be a great saute oil, but um, I hope that speaks to answering the question. Yeah, I think so. I think that's, they were just wondering about how they might accidentally be pushing up those omega-6s unintentionally. So yeah, I think you, I think you tackled it. Uh, so the next question is about best gateway fruits. This is a person who's been really challenged trying to get their four-year-old to get more fiber in. They're aware they have a fiber problem. So she said, what are the best gateway fruits and vegetables. And then she also wondered about optimal water per day, like how, how what, what you'd Great ideally questions. want to see going Great in. Questions. Yeah. So our go-to in terms of water recommendation, and that's pure water. Um, you can use a few drops of juice to sweeten. You can use um, lemon juice as needed, but really we just want water going in, and that's one ounce per pound of body weight daily. Um, and that typically normalizes and assists with that constipation. Um, the other thing I would say in terms of gateway um, products are, um, it's so tricky because I don't know what an individual's preferences are, 
but anything, and, and you have to tease that out in terms of both uh, dietary preferences and also are we dealing with any food responsiveness that we have to eliminate? So can we put berries in or not? Can we put grapes in or not? Um, so I have to decline on answering that one without more information, I think. I'm sorry. Um, but I was, yeah. yep. the one thing that for families kind of making this transition as you're introducing new foods to the diet and as you're eliminating others, and you need to increase that fiber because you have a child who doesn't like most fruits and vegetables, I would say there's a product out called George's Aloe Water that has been around forever. There are other aloe products as well, but this one seems to be helpful for many, many individuals in providing just enough extra fiber to assist with, you know, regular bowel movements. All right. Okay, so the next one is, if we decide to do this despite having testing or any evidence and we're doing it anecdotally, what's the minimum amount of time that we need to give it before we give up or we decide it's working? Great question. I feel like, and what we counsel families to do here, um, I, we base our information on the data. So we know that um, any response that we can, that we know how to test for right now. So if we're talking about gluten and you've done all the testing and the celiac panel is negative, IgG and Ig. G, IgG and IgE testing is negative. There's no issue at all that we, we know how to test for. Um, we know that for kids who do test positive on those tested parameters, it takes six months for those levels to normalize after the last exposure. So we have lots of stuff out there that we don't know how to test for. I mean, when we started doing this almost 20 years ago now, there was not a panel that allowed us to see four types of gluten response. There is now. We, and that's how far our science has come. Um, and that gives us more parameters for assessing whether someone is truly gluten responsive or not. So I believe there are many other things that we don't know how to test for out there um, that our, our laboratory science isn't there yet. And I just apply that same standard to kids who have negative values on the current testing. So let's go for six months. Um, and that will give us the most conservative objective viewpoint on whether or not this works. Okay, so this will be our last question. We're almost out of time, but this is probably something that you run into quite a bit as a clinician. Uh, what do you do when you get contradictory tests? You've already said quite clearly that none of this is an imperfect world. <laughs> so, for example, this person, I, I had several questions about this, but one person described having positive celiac testing, but then negative intestinal biopsies. So as a clinician, when you are supporting families, how do you navigate that? So for me, it depends on clinical presentation of the individual. So if the child clearly looks symptomatic or responsive in a way on a full physical evaluation, and or the family is fully committed to doing an intervention anyway, regardless of the diet, then we proceed with dietary intervention. If the child falls in a subset of kids that we see where it truly looks like they are not a responder across any variables, and there are other labs that we can look at that kind of go in tandem with that too. So if there's any elevated total IgE or other peripheral mark, any elevated um, inflammatory markers. Any, everything is negative and everything looks good and the family does not feel like dietary intervention is a path they want to pursue. We are good with that too. And if this situation that you mentioned comes back, I would lean toward simply because there is not a positive biopsy does not mean that there isn't a gluten responsivity happening because we know now celiac disease is an end stage disease. It's diagnosed when the damage is done to the villi in the gut, but it's a process and it takes that, you know, 95% of the time across that process to get to the point 
of being diagnostically viable on a gold standard biopsy. So if that positive lab reflection is actually, uh, okay, we're on this path, um, but there's no villi damage yet, then I, I, I would encourage a family to pursue intervention if it's something that they are interested in and committed to.